Well, hello everyone, and welcome to SIOP 2021. I'm Jeff Dome from Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC. And I'd like to thank Wade Kiono and the members of the local organizing committee for inviting us to present this educational symposium on the treatment of recurrent Wilms tumor. I have no disclosures to make. The treatment of Wilms tumor is one of the great success stories in all of the field of pediatric oncology. In the United States, due to improvements in surgical techniques and then radiation therapy and then refinements in chemotherapy, the survival rate for Wilms tumor is now about 90%. Unfortunately, this um, excellent survival rate hasn't been achieved in the rest of the world. For example, there's an excellent Wilms tumor program in Malawi, and in 2012, the projected survival rate was only 46%, which is better than it used to be, and this continues to improve, but this shows that um, survival rates for Wilms tumor are not equal around the globe. One of the major causes of uh, treatment failure and death in Wilms tumor is relapse. So wherever you are in the world, relapse is a problem. The other issue with relapse is that although there are patients who survive, these survivors are at increased risk of long-term side effects, including cardiac toxicity, second malignancies, and infertility. And relapse also takes a psychological and economic toll on the patient and family. So patients feel like they're out of the woods when they finish their first line of therapy, only to be faced with the second or third line of therapy that's often much more difficult to get through than the first line of treatment. So in today's session, we hope to provide some of the latest updates on the treatment of relapsed Wilms tumor. I'll start off by giving the COG perspective and then Filippo Sprifico, who has led SIOP uh, relapse Wilms tumor efforts for many years, will talk about the SIOP perspective. Marcio Malikolovkin, who has studied autologous transplant in Wilms tumor, will try to answer the age old question of whether or not to give high dose therapy with stem cell rescue. And then Amy Waltz, who leads the developmental therapeutics. Uh, committee in the COG Renal Tumor Committee will talk about some of the exciting new agents in the treatment of Wilms tumor. And then at the end, we hope to have about 15 minutes for questions and answers, which the participants can put in the chat, and we'll be monitoring the chat and answer the questions uh, together as a panel. So without further ado, I'll jump into the COG perspective on the treatment of relapsed Wilms tumor. So let's start by assessing the burden of relapse in the current COG treatment setting. The good news is that event-free survival has never been better. And that means that there are fewer relapses. For favorable histology, patients with loss of heterozygosity at 1P and 16Q, and stage four with incomplete lung nodule response had uh, markedly improved event-free survival in the most recent generation of COG studies compared to National Wilms Tumor Study 5. And you could see that over here. Interestingly now, if you look across the stages, the event-free survival is not much different from stage one disease to stage four disease. Of, of course, um, so, th so there's a narrow range there. Of course, patients with stage four disease receive much more intensive treatment than patients with stage one disease. And that has implications for the treatments of relapse disease as well. For anaplastic histology, we've also shown improvement in outcomes. Um, although except for stage one disease, the outcomes are still much worse than for uh, favorable histology tumors. And in the recent generation of studies, you can see that um, we've made a, a nice improvement in outcome for stage one anaplasia, stage three anaplasia, and stage five or bilateral disease with anaplasia. One of the early formal studies of relapsed Wilms tumor was this report on prognostic factors 
among children with relapse treated on National Wilms Tumor Studies 2 and 3. This was a retrospective study because there wasn't a defined relapse study at the time. And, and this report included 367 patients with relapse after achieving initial remission. Most of these patients were treated with vincristine, dactinomycin, and doxorubicin and radiation. So they got some of the same agents they got for their initial treatment, although uh, some got re uh, received cyclophosphamide and some also received cisplatin and etoposide. And, and overall, the three-year overall survival after relapse was only 30%. The study looked at prognostic factors, and the most important prognostic factor was histology. This Kaplan-Meier curve that sh shows that survival after relapse was better for patients with favorable histology tumors compared to unfavorable histology. And the study also showed that outcomes were improved in National Wilms Tumor Study 3 compared to National Wilms Tumor Study 2. And that's probably due to the um, additional agents that were available in the later time period. But, but interestingly, even in the later time period, there wasn't much difference in survival for the patients with unfavorable histology relapses. Another prognostic factor that came out was that uh, patients with late relapse, which were, was defined as 12 or more months from diagnosis, had better outcomes compared to patients with early relapse, which was defined as zero to five months from diagnosis. And another prognostic factor was the site of relapse. Patients with relapse to the lung only had better outcomes compared to patients with relapse in the abdomen or at other sites. And also patients with stage one disease had better outcomes than patients with stage four disease at initial presentation. And that's like, likely reflected um, in the number of drugs that were used. So patients with stage one disease received fewer drugs for initial treatment than patients with stage four disease. So that uh, data provided the basis for the first prospective study of relapse Wilms tumor conducted as part of National Wilms Tumor Study 5. And in this study, patients who were initially treated with just two drugs, vincristine and dactinomycin, received a salvage regimen of, called Regimen I, which was vincristine, doxorubicin, and cyclophosphamide alternating with cyclophosphamide and etoposide, as well as radiation. So patients, um, so that was one arm of the study. And then the other arm was for patients who received initial treatment with three drugs, vincristine, doxorubicin, and dactinomycin. And those patients received a regimen called stratum C, which was alternating pairs of cyclophosphamide and etoposide and carboplatin and etoposide. And these are the results of that study. The patients who initially were treated with the two drug therapy who received regimen I had a four year overall survival after relapse of 81%. And patients treated with initially with three drugs who received stratum C had a four year overall survival of 48%. This study also looked at prognostic factors. And as I just showed, initial treatment with two drug therapy was associated with better outcome than initial treatment with three drug therapy. Interestingly, the, the both studies show that males had worse outcomes compared to females. And the time to recurrence and site of recurrence were not prognostically significant in these studies. So remember that that was prognostic, prognostically significant in NWTS two and three, but in the treatment context, with the treatment regimen that was used in NWTS5, those factors were not prognostically significant. More recently, in a study led by Elizabeth Mullen, we looked again at the National Wilms Tumor Study 5 patient population with an eye toward looking at imaging-related prognostic factors at relapse and the role of surveillance imaging. This study included about 335 patients with relapse and confirmed once again the disparate outcomes between relapse after uh, relapse in favorable histology compared to relapse 
with anaplastic histology. Interestingly, there was evidence in this study that the burden of relapse correlated with outcome. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve that shows the post-relapse survival depending on the number of relapse foci present. You can see a trend that the more foci of relapse that were present, the worse the survival. So the top curves are one uh, focus of relapse versus two to three, they were similar, but you can see that if there were four to six foci of relapse or more than six foci of relapse, the survival was worse. Also supporting the idea that higher tumor burden is associated with higher risk and lower survival was um, the size of the, the relapse, the, the greatest diameter of, of the relapse lesion. And in this Kaplan-Meier curve, we broke that down um, with a cut point of two centimeters or, or uh, greater than two centimeters. And you could see that the relapses that were more than two centimeters had lower survival compared to relapses that were less than two centimeters in diameter. But also interestingly, there was no difference in outcome between patients whose relapse was one to two centimeters compared to less than one centimeter in diameter, suggesting that there's a threshold that must be reached before the higher tumor burden has a negative effect. So having more disease is bad, but at, at um, the lower end of, of that range, uh, there isn't a difference that's seen. And perhaps that explains a key result of the study, which found no benefit of detection of relapse with CT scans versus chest X-ray and abdominal ultrasounds. And in fact, in this Kaplan-Meier curve, there, was, there seemed to be a slight survival advantage when relapses were detected by X-ray and ultrasound versus CT, but really there's no difference. Um, and that leads us to recommend imaging surveillance with just X-rays and ultrasounds rather than CT scans or MRI scans for most patients with favorable histology Wilms tumor. And all that background brings us to the current study for re relapse Wilms tumor, which is called AREN 1921. Based on all those analyses of prognostic factors, we can break relapsed Wilms tumor into three groups. There's a lower or standard risk group that's composed of patients with favorable histology disease, initially treated with two drugs, and we expect an overall survival there of about 80%. There's a higher risk group, which is favorable histology Wilms tumor initially treated with three or more drugs, and there we expect an overall survival of about 50%. And then there's a group of very high risk tumors, which are the relapsed tumors with anaplasia, especially diffuse anaplasia, where the overall survival after relapse is only 10%. So the AREN 1921 study is chaired by Jim Geller and Raj Venkatramani. And the key hypothesis of the study is that the addition of camptothecins, topotecan and arenatecan, to multi-agent chemotherapy will improve outcomes in patients with relapsed favorable histology Wilms tumor. The rationale for using these agents started off with xenograft studies that, that were conducted uh, by Peter Houghton um, at St. Jude. And, um, and in, in these panels, topotecan and arenatecan were among the most active agents that were, were seen and, and a number of agents were screened. And, and that led to a phase two study of topotecan as a single agent for relapse Wilms tumor. And in that study, we saw a 48% response rate in very heavily pretreated relapse favorable histology Wilms tumor, which showed a, a high level of activity of this agent. And then subsequently, in the AREN0321 study um, conducted by COG for newly diagnosed diffuse anaplastic Wilms tumor, there was a phase two vincristine arena TCAN window and the response rate there was close to 80%. And the SIOP renal tumor study group also observed responses to various arena TCAN containing regimens. 
and there were case series that showed responses to vincristine, arena, tecan, temozolomide, and bevacizumab combinations. So in all, there's a lot of evidence to support the activity of topotecan and arena tecan in Wilms tumor. The schema of AREN 1921 is therefore that for patients with relapse disease, if they have the standard risk relapse or receive just two agents initially, they get a regimen called UH3 that includes vincristine and arena tecan. For patients with high risk favorable histology uh, relapses, those are those who receive more than three, three or more chemotherapy drugs, they'll receive a regimen of ICE, ifosfamide, carboplatin, etoposide, alternating with cyclophosphamide and topotecan. And patients with very high risk relapse, those are the relapse, relapsed anaplastic Wilms tumors, they're not treated on this study. And those patients are encouraged to enroll on phase two or phase one studies. I'll point out that this study also includes patients with newly diagnosed stage two to four diffuse anaplastic Wilms tumor, and they receive this regimen called UH3. And, and that regimen is outlined over here. That's alternating vincristine, doxorubis, and cyclophosphamide with cyclophosphamide, carboplatin, etoposide, and also cycles of vincristine and arena tecan. And this is the schema of the ICE cyclophosphamide topotecan regimen, which includes 10 cycles altogether of alternating ICE and cyclo and topo. The AREN 1921 opened in September of 2020. It's accruing very well. And we're very pleased that this study was selected by the Children's Oncology Group to be one of the high impact studies that's funded by Amazon. So Amazon has been supportive of childhood cancer research and institutions receive $10,000 if they open the study in addition to three other studies that were designated as high impact studies. So for those in COG who are out there in the virtual world listening to this, please open the AREN 1921 study. So in summary, the survival after Wilms tumor relapse has improved substantially from National Wilms tumor studies two and three to National Wilms tumor study five. The main prognostic factors now in the current treatment setting are histology and initial treatment, two drugs versus three or more drugs. And the new COG protocols will assess the benefit of incorporating camptothecins. I'd like to thank all of the members of the COG Renal Tumor Committee for contributing to this work. Uh, the committee is chaired by Conrad Fernandez and uh, vice chaired by Jim Geller and Elizabeth Mullen. And we have an outstanding group of uh, an outstanding committee of um, professionals who lead different studies and lead different disciplines. So I'll end with that and pass on the talk to the next speaker, who is Filippo. Sprifico. And again, we'll take questions at the end of the four presentations. So thank you for listening and for your participation. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. First of all, uh, I would like to thank you for this kind invitation, which I really uh, much appreciate. Uh, and uh, I, I also think that when we talk about uh, children with relapsed spin tumor, we need to remark that we are talking about uh, a group of children, hopefully with a still curable disease in a significant proportion of of patients, which is something that we need to take into, into consideration when we think about uh, uh, priorities and needs for this group of patients. Uh, there are different reasons to behind this high curability. And uh, I think that uh, among those reasons, uh, uh, one main reason is that uh, most of children with a Wilms tumor uh, are initially treated with a minimal chemotherapy across almost uh, 
all the protocols uh, worldwide. For instance, these are data from SIOP 2001, showing us that in absolute number, the great majority, most of the relapses come from the group of children initially traded only with vincrisin and actinomycin D. So meaning that uh, uh, we still have a gap for improvement uh, at relapse uh, by using all other additional known effective drugs. But also basing on this, uh, uh, we recognize and we need to be aware that VIMS tumor relapse uh, is not among uh, the main priorities in pediatric oncology when we need to make choices about how to allocate limited resources. Just to give you an example, a few years ago, we discussed about a transatlantic trial on the rule of high-dose chemotherapy in relapsed VIMS tumor, which was not funded because consider less, uh, uh, less priority compared to other pediatric disease. So keeping this uh, few background in mind, few years ago, we, uh, as a SIOP renal tumor study group, uh, we aim to have an homogeneous guideline to treat patients with relapse and the treatment recommendation in, uh, in, in the general protocol called umbrella, which would be the focus of my talk today. With these specific objectives, first of all, to provide as many, to as many patients as possible, the best available treatment options. So for different, for many centers, for many countries, uh, there were very heterogeneous approach to the treatment of patients with a relapse. So one main goal was to provide a sort of standard of care as homogeneous as possible to as many patients as possible and try to collect good quality data on patients with relapse uh, to implement our understanding and as a further aim to uh, better characterize and to better uh, um, and to implement uh, our knowledge on the molecular uh, um, uh, omics profile of these patients. And last but not least, at least in Europe, uh, to improve the level of uh, uh, activity on, of new agent uh, in, in specifically for patients with a vein tumor. Well, first of all, how patients that relapse uh, are stratified in umbrella protocol. In, in therapy for recurrent disease, uh, it mainly depends on initially treatment received, so initially treatment intensity, but which in turn uh, is reflecting known prognostic factors inherent in the primary tumor, like tumor stage or histology. So in a certain sense, initial treatment intensity might be a surrogate of uh, uh, additional prognostic factors. And basing on that, we will have three risk groups in umbrella. We will have the standard risk called the AA in the umbrella, that means patients initially traded only with vincristin, with or without actinomycin D and no radiation therapy. Then we have the high risk patients called BB group. That means patients initially traded with at least three drugs. Most of those patients will have received vincristin, actinomycin D and doxorubicin. And then the very high risk group of patients called CC, that mean patients with initially advanced stage diffuse anaplastic or blastemal type psyop histology. Uh, well, we need to recognize that uh, it's likely that, uh, that the best classification schema probably does not exist. There are other factors which are not taken into consideration like the time elapsing from diagnosis to relapse. Uh, and we also need to be aware that primary therapies have changed over the period that these studies on prognostic factors that relapse were conducted. Does any, uh, any prognostic schema at relapse would need to be cognizant of the current situations. 
Just to give an example, patients with a stage three intermediate risk in SIOP 2001 did receive different treatment according to the randomizations with or without doxorubicin and are going to receive a different treatments in the current SIOP umbrella. And also because of this, uh, we think that risk groups should not be uh, entirely prospective in the sense that uh, it's uh, the responsibility of uh, the treating clinician to decide which risk category best describes the initial treatment intensity that their patients had received prior to relapse. Uh, indeed, we uh, tried to validate this classification, uh, this risk classification through a retrospective analysis in a large cohort of patients, uh, which were stratified according to the initial treatment. And as we can see, we can have this three groups of patients at relapse with significantly different post-relapse expected event free survival, which uh, I think it's important to keep in mind because according to expected event free survival, we have different uh, clinical or research needs or priorities. For instance, for the standard risk patients with an expected event-free survival after relapse in the range of 70%, we may even consider to optimize the, the, the current treatment also in a view of a de-escalation, and we need to mind about late sequelae. But on the other uh, hand of the spectrum, for the very high risk patients with a dismal spronosis at relapse, we need to improve access to new drugs. So what I'm going to do now is to, to, to pass through these three different groups and try to share with you which was the rationale behind our uh, choices. For the standard risk AA group, as Jeff already pointed out, we can consider uh, as a sort of standard of care uh, for this group of patients, uh, the result obtained with the stratum, uh, stratum B of the National Vim's Tumor Study 5 protocol uh, all by alternating cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, and cyclophosphamide etoposide, which was very similar to a prospective protocol uh, by the UK group. So when we uh, ask ourselves uh, how we might improve this uh, standard of care, uh, we could have different option. I just want to just to exclude the, the option of the high dose chemotherapy in the setting of standard risk patients. And as a group, uh, the, the SIOP renal tumor study group opted, decided to uh, invest on having carboplatin as an additional drug, try to improve and to compare to this standard of care. So this is. Uh, the regimen AA that we are recommending for the standard risk group, which includes, includes uh, eight total courses alternating a uh, rather standard combination of drugs like cyclophosphamide uh, doxorubicin and carboplatin etoposide, because uh, we have uh, uh, very good data on phase one and two on the efficacy of carboplatin in Vim's tumor and the combination of carboplatin and etoposide is a rather well combination uh, uh, known in pediatric oncology and with a synergistic uh, effect. Uh, well, I, I don't want to anticipate much results and I, I ask you to go to see the a poster by doc, during this uh, uh, SIOP Congress by Dr. Uh, Groenendik because a uh, few months ago, we had the chance to retrospectively, uh, retrospectively analyze a, 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 a large cohort of patients treated uh, uh, with the characteristics of the AA group uh, traded in the SIOP corporations specific to implement the level of evidence of our current recommendation, but they would, with a specific focus on analyzing whether for this group of patients, we might also consider 
to reduce, to de-escalate treatment in the future. And one specific question was to compare patients treated at relapse with only three drugs, that is vincristine, actinomycin D, and, and anthracycline, comparing to more intensive ice-based uh, chemotherapy. I think that the focus and one main aim of this analysis is to see and to explore whether in the future we might, in, uh, we might select subgroup of AA patients who could receive an even less intensive treatment. So what about the high risk and the very high risk groups for which I think that we have uh, shareable questions uh, like the question on the rule of high-dose chemotherapy that Marcio Malogolokin is going to take in later this, this afternoon, or which novel agents we might incorporate. Uh, Dr. Hemi Waltz is going to, to talk about that. So just uh, to share with you that uh, in the SIOP umbrella protocol, we, uh, uh, we eventually decided to uh, validate uh, the evidence and our knowledge about uh, uh, conventional chemotherapy like ifosfamide, cyclophosphamide, carboplatin, and toposide in an intensive way. And so this is the regimen BB, which is prescribed for high-risk patients with a, an induction phases of phase of four courses alternating uh, highs, ifosfamide, carboplatin, and toposide with cyclophosphamide, uh, carboplatin, and toposide with the, with the purpose of replacing Ifosfamide with cyclophosphamide for uh, reducing the risk of nephrotoxicity, and then uh, to prescribe high dose malphalan as a sort of consolidation, but to leave at the treating uh, local physician the choice also as an alternative to consolidate with two further courses of, uh, of uh, uh, standard chemotherapy. So, just want to be clear. This is not a randomized study, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll leave at the decision of the trading physician whether or not to consolidate with high-dose chemotherapy so that hopefully we might have uh, two groups of patients traded with or without high-dose chemotherapy to compare with. So one main purpose of regime and BB is to reinforce our knowledge of intensive standard backbone of effective drugs like ICE or CCE, with which possibly incorporating the future biologically target agents. So again, to clarify, this is not a randomized trial and uh, uh, um, we just propose the use of high-dose melphalan as intensification, as consolidations, but only in those patients with proven responding to initial reinduction treatment. So, and what about uh, the very high risk, the CC group? Just want to remind you that we are talking about uh, children with initial advanced stage, uh, high risk histology tumors, diffuse anaplasia, sometimes combined with the blastemal type. And it's important to, to, to remark that whether for some patients with relapsed limb tumor, like the AA group, the major COVID of initial treatment failure is relative under treatment. For these very high risk children, the intrinsic chemo resistance to drugs is the main cause of failure. So let's think that this group of patients already has received almost all the armamentarium of effective drugs uh, uh, up front. Uh, well, uh, basing on the evidence we had, we decided to explore uh, more, but to base our choice on Arinotican, mainly basing on the experience published by the group of Marcio Malogolokin uh, on four patients, but and in combination with Temozolamaiva and Bevacizumab, in basing on the results presented by the children's oncology group that Jeff Tom just mentioned with the use of irinotican and vincristing as an upfront window in newly diagnosed diffuse anaplastic metastatic patients, but that represented the main rationale for us to recommending uh, 
an harinotecan based backbone as a sort of reinduction in those patients with a very high risk tumor. And then the questions with novel agents to incorporate in this backbone, I am afraid that we do not have a good answer. To answer these questions, we did a, a retrospective analysis on available published phase one and two trials. And just we concluded that the standard chemotherapy seemed more promising on short term than other drugs. So this is the reason why we did not uh, uh, decided to invest on additional drugs. And this is, uh, I would not call guideline. This is uh, some advices which are included for the group CC in the umbrella. That is to start with a, a sort of reinduction or a bridge regimen including high rinotecan with or without temozolamide. And then in the few months, in umbrella uh, protocol endorses initiatives dedicated to molecular profiling of relapsed tumor in collaboration with uh, precision medicine programs now available across Europe or across ITCC center. And as a, as a SIOP renal tumor study group, we specifically uh, endorse uh, a feasibility study uh, at Princess Maxima Center, uh, chaired by Jarno Drosse and Annalise Marvin Kurve, a, a feasibility study of organoid growing with couple drug testing in patients with a relapsed dense tumor. Well, eventually, this is the, the flow chart uh, in the SIOP umbrella that is, we have uh, uh, three different levels of recommendation according to uh, risk stratifications. Well, let me conclude with just a couple of slides because when we talk about relapse, uh, we, I think that uh, we less focus on how to properly administer surgery and radiation therapy, which is very challenging because we do not have uh, much evidence to base our decision. So in the current umbrella, we aim to have some share uh, guideline or some homogeneous principles to share with the centers. And for as far, uh, as, far as surgery, we think that uh, one main principles is that uh, uh, not to upfront uh, operate a relapsing tumor, but primary surgery only for late solitary lung or liver nodules. So one principle is chemotherapy first, uh, and to consider surgery only if we have uh, uh, with, with, the, with the purpose of to reach a complete or uh, submaximal recession, but only in, pre, in, in tumors with a shown uh, chemo responsiveness to a, a given induction. And also for radiation therapy, which I think is uh, even more challenging, we try to share with our radiation therapy experts some guidelines in principles, we do think that we should always administer radiation therapy at the site of relapse. And I think that we can roughly distinguish the patients into two groups. Those patients with a relapse in a not previously irradiated site for whom we do think that we could recommend same radiation therapy doses as first line. And the group of patients uh, with a relapse in a previously already irradiated site. But again, we think that uh, the initial low radiation therapy dose that we use in Wim's tumor is likely to give a second chance uh, to response to high fair radiation therapy dose. So we, we claim for discussing with the uh, radiation therapies for re-induction in, in all the cases. So as a final sharing, uh, I think that for the AA and for the BB group of patients, uh, a backbone of effective conventional drugs uh, is still the winning team for many relapsing tumors. For the CC group, uh, we do not have a, 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 a let's say, a, a good um, guideline to propose. I think that the, the generation of a tumor molecular profile for each patient to inform new drug testing is a priority at the moment, and uh, also a stronger guidance to administer local uh, re-therapy in terms of surgery and radiation. It's, uh, it's something we need to, to focus. 
So let me thank uh, all my colleagues of the renal tumor study group, uh, different panels uh, and subcommittee, uh, and above all, uh, the chair, Norbert Graf, and the vice chair, Mary van der Heuvel, and uh, the, a core group of colleagues uh, who are very actively cooperating the relapse committee, Jasper Broca, Annalise, Mavin Kurve, Jarno Dross, and Daniela Perotti. And I would like to thank you for listening to me. All right, thank you very much. The next presentation will be given by Marcio Malagolovkin. Thank you, um, uh, Jeff. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, sharing our experience uh, uh, with uh, bone marrow transplant for Wilms tumor and try to address the longstanding question about transplant or not transplant for patients with relapsed Wilms tumor. And I have no conflicts of interest and no use of off-label medications will be discussed. So uh, the reality is, is that the value of high-dose therapy with stem cell rescue to treat patients with a recurrent Wilms tumor remains unsettled. Uh, there is a big question that we all have is why one would consider the use of a high-dose therapy for those patients. And the response comes from the fact that we know that uh, using higher doses of chemotherapy may have a better effect in terms of tumor uh, cell kill. However, this uh, dose increase is associated with a lot of side effects, especially hematopoietic toxicity, which is a limiting factor for dose intensification. Therefore, in order to uh, overcome that, many uh, colleagues have used uh, autologous bone marrow transplant as a way to intensify uh, chemotherapy and overcome the risks of hematopoietic toxicities. So, um, So uh, what are the advantages for transplant and what do we discuss when we approach a family and suggest the use of bone marrow transplant as part of the intensification of their child therapy? Why do we discuss that? One is that as we just mentioned, uh, using uh, bone marrow transplant uh, after high dose chemotherapy is a way to dose intensify the chemotherapy at one point uh, for those patients with relapse or recurrent disease. Also, we know that there are many effective drugs like melphalan and tiotipa that we cannot use on a regular setting uh, due to its extreme toxicity. And we know that they are very effective against Wilms tumor. So using autologous bone marrow transplant uh, after high dose uh, therapy allow us to incorporate uh, those agents. Also, one possibility is that consolidating these patients with autologous bone marrow transplant may shorten the length of therapy. What are the disadvantage of transplant? Obviously, uh, many malignancies may be resistant to chemotherapy, even high dose chemotherapy. Um, not necessarily the case for Wilms tumor, uh, unless uh, anaplastic tumors, but many malignancies involve the bone marrow. So obviously uh, there is always the risk of reintroducing tumors. Uh, as you uh, do the stem cell rescue. We know, and we're still learning that uh, bone marrow transplant is associated with acute and long-term toxicities, and one needs to uh, consider them uh, when choosing uh, this therapeutic approach. But more important is that the data that is available to support or not to support the use of autologous bone marrow transplant are retrospective of data usually based on very small studies, and there has been absolutely no randomized trials over the years. 
Um, we have seen this in multiple uh, versions already from the presentation of doc Dr. Dome and Dr. Spriafico. And as you can see, uh, those patients with standard risk, they have uh, greater than 70, 80% expected uh, free uh, event-free survival. So I think that those patients really uh, are indicated to uh, be candidates for high-dose therapy and uh, stem cell transplant. Uh, or rescue. However, those patients with high risk, uh, those patients with favorable histology would relapse after three drugs as discussed previously, or those very high risk patients with underplasia or blastemo type, those are the patients that may, may benefit from uh, this uh, therapeutic approach. So where do we base our data uh, to support and to decide the use or not use uh, bone marrow transplant? Uh, over the years, we have seen many, many, many studies, uh, mostly um, a single institution, small uh, number of patients, starting early in 1990s uh, with Dr. Garaventa uh, that showed the use of uh, mostly a conditional regimen with melphalan and showing some benefit of the use of transplant. Over the years, you, you've seen many, many uh, small reports ranging from a dozen uh, to about 40 patients, and all of them had uh, some uh, indication that transplant was uh, uh, useful, but none of them showed significant benefits. So uh, not a long time ago, Ha et al. Um, uh, did a uh, retrospective study uh, of the literature to review the event-free survival and overall survival from many publications, about 18 publications, describing the outcome for children with relapsed Wilms tumor. The comparisons were made between those patients receiving myeloablative high-dose chemotherapy with autologous stem cell rescue and those who did not. It's very, very important to notice that this is a retrospective review of relevant published data. So again, this is not a prospective study. There were no randomized studies in this analysis. All 18 studies uh, were um, not single arm, non-randomized. And what is very important to notice is that there was a very large group of uh, chemotherapy regimens used uh, for um, consolidation of these patients or the high dose therapy phase. As Dr. Spreafico mentioned, uh, the results were not very uh, uh, different. What we found out is that those patients receiving high dose therapy followed by stem cell rescue uh, had a pretty much a similar result as uh, those patients receiving chemotherapy. So uh, as we saw in terms of the uh, risk stratification, we know that there is a difference of the use of both chemotherapy as well as high dose uh, transplant. As you can see on the right side of the panel, you can see that uh, the results for stage one, two, uh, the standard risk, high risk, or very high risk, you know, there was some difference, but not significant difference between the high dose therapy and, and standard chemotherapy. So, however, uh, the result of this analysis showed that when all the data was pulled, there was some suggestion of advantage of high dose therapy uh, followed by stem cell rescue. However, it never got to a statistical uh, significance. So the evidence suggests a great deal of uncertainty concerning the role of high dose therapy with stem cell rescue in patients following relapse after treatment for the Wilms tumor. So some advantage, but not statistically significant. Uh, we uh, did a, a review of patients uh, enrolled in the Center of International Blood and Marrow Transplantation, approximately 250 patients uh, transplanted between uh, uh, 1990 and 2013. What we've noticed on this uh, 
group is that uh, there was a lot of heterogeneity uh, in terms of the patients that were uh, transplanted. And what was very interesting is that we saw about 25% of those patients, they were transplanted without ever achieving a complete uh, response of their tumor or the presence of residual disease. Uh, as you can see, those mission had a better outcome compared to those uh, that had disease present. And the overall, the data suggested that high dose therapy followed by stem cell transplant was very well tolerated and outcomes were comparable to those reported in the literature. Also not shown in this slide was the fact that uh, the type of therapy, the high dose therapy that we used did not make a significant difference for those patients. So in conclusion of the study, uh, the recommendation that one should balance the potential benefit of high dose therapy followed by stem cell transplant with the unknown long-term risks of transplant for patients following relapse after treatment for their Wilms tumor. So probably no different result, but one should carefully select the patients that should go on to receive transplant. Uh, Spreafical et al. Uh, reporting on the European Society of Blood and Bone Marrow Transplantation uh, review their data and basically use their data to increase the level of evidence regarding children with U relapsed Wilms tumor receiving autologous high dose therapy followed by stem cell transplant as consolidation of first or second remission after relapse based on the review of 69 patients. What is very important is that uh, on this study, there were patients that were transplanted in first remission and patients that were also transplanted on second or greater uh, remissions. And a total of 29% of those patients transplanted were transplanted or on first uh, remission. Uh, also, as you uh, heard from Dr. Spriafico, many of those patients receive melphalan al alone, and we'll talk about this result in a moment. Uh, the overall in, uh, uh, survival and event-free survival was about 63 and 67%, which is a very uh, uh, um, good result for these patients. But again, it's very important that we notice that this is a retrospective study non-randomized and included patients that were in first CR. So uh, as you can see uh, here, uh, those patients in first CR had, you know, a slightly better, but no statistical different uh, result from those patients in second CR or greater. And you also see a slight advantage of the use of melphalan alone 0.79% uh, advanced free survival, overall survival compared with other regimens. Although not statistically significant, uh, melphalan was associated with uh, less toxicity. So in conclusion, this study provided further data to improve the basis for future evidence-based clinical decision-making when using high-dose therapy and autologous stem cell transplant for relapse and refractory Wilms tumor uh, patients. Most recently, Kobayashi and his uh, group uh, uh, reported on the Japanese Transplant Registry Unified Management Program and reported on the analysis of um, their patients with renal tumors. Those tumors, those patients included not only Wilms tumor and nephroblastomas, but also included uh, clear cell sarcomas and malignant rhabdoid tumors of the kidneys. The study was uh, to analyze the results of autologous stem cell transplant for children and adult patients. And there were about uh, five patients uh, that were adults at time of transplants. Of note, 24% of the patients transplanted were transplanted in first CR. 
23, uh, 33% was transplanted in second CR, and 20% 20 20 of the patients were transplanted without ever achieving uh, CR, that is, they had residual disease. And there was about 16% uh, of the patients that were classified as being transplanted uh, in relapse. It's not clear from the manuscript if those patients uh, received any therapy or received consolidation as their therapy. So their results showed that for patients with nephroblastoma, uh, the overall survival was 72%. However, it's very important to remember that 20% uh, 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 of those patients, as mentioned before, were in first CR. So their conclusion was that autologous stem cell transplant was beneficial for patients with refractory and relapsed nephroblastoma, but not for those patients with CCSK and um, uh, rhabdoid tumors of the kidneys. So one of the questions that is still remain is what is the uh, best condition and regimen to be used at this time? Is a, a regimen of melphalan containing regimens like melphalan etoposide and carboplatin that is widely used for the treatment of this tumor? Is melphalan single agent? other carboplatin-containing regimens or thiotipa-containing regimens. As we heard from Dr. Spriafico, uh, the use of uh, melphalan alone showed a small uh, uh, improvement in the uh, overall survival of the patients transplanted with uh, this regimen. However, uh, the statistical uh, strength was limited because one, this is not a randomized study, it's a retrospective study. However, uh, it's very important to know that although to date no uh, regimen has been associated with superior outcome, according to Dr. Espreafica's uh, data, uh, the, the use of melphalan alone is well supported and is not inferior uh, than other regimens with the good EFS and OS. And it's much better associated with uh, engraftment and is definitely less toxic than other regimens. So um, in conclusion, uh, the role of high dose therapy with stem cell rescue in patients with a relapsed Wilms tumor is still not fully uh, defined. Uh, the use of uh, high dose therapy and stem cell transplant may play a role in the treatment of patients with relapsed high and very high risk Wilms tumor who achieve complete response or as Dr. Uh, Spriafico mentioned, at least a very good partial response yet to be defined. So in conclusion, attempts to conduct a randomized trial comparing chemotherapy versus high dose therapy followed by autologous stem cell transplant have failed. Therefore, one should balance the potential benefits of using this strategy with the yet unknown long-term risk of high-dose therapy and stem cell transplant when considering treatment for patients with relapsed Wilms tumor. Uh, this uh, work would not be possible unless we had all the collaboration of all the many uh, uh, renal tumor uh, committees throughout the world. Um, that uh, is an uh, effort and a knowledge that is a result of all uh, scientists interested in the care of patients with uh, relapsed Wilms tumor and the important data from the CIBMTR, the European Society of Bone Marrow uh, Transplantation, as well the Japanese Society of Hematopoietic Cell Transplantation. Also, we have always to remember that we could never achieve any of this uh, knowledge without our nurses and clinical researchers research coordinator support, but most important for the courageous patients and families uh, that allow us to uh, provide uh, the care for them and allow us to gain knowledge and improve the long-term survival of this uh, challenging disease. Thank you very much. I would like now to ask um, uh, Dr. 
Jeff Dome to introduce the next speaker. All right, thank you very much, Marcio. And our final speaker of the session before the question and answers is Dr. Amy Waltz. Amy? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending my talk today. I'm going to be talking about um, some molecular pathways of interest in relapsed Wilms tumors. And thank you to Jeff Dome for allowing me the opportunity to present today. So just to start, I have no financial conflicts of interest or disclosures to report. The objectives of the talk today are to review the genetics of Wilms tumors, to discuss barriers to early phase Wilms tumor clinical trials, to discuss current approaches to sequencing and trial enrollment for relapse and refractory Wilms tumor patients, and finally, to discuss upcoming COG clinical trials and pathways of interest in relapsed Wilms tumor patients. So first, a review of the Wilms tumor genetic landscape, just to sort of set the stage for what we're going to discuss today. So through the TARGET initiative, which stands for Therapeutically Applicable Research to Generate Effective Treatments, this was a National Cancer Institute initiative that used a comprehensive approach to define molecular changes that drive a variety of different childhood cancers, including neuroblastoma, ALL, AML, osteosarcoma, and a particular interest for us today, renal tumors. The goal was really to identify therapeutic targets for use in future treatment regimens using integrative analysis of genomic sequencing, copy number, and gene expression data. This involved a discovery set of 117 Wilms tumors who were registered on National Wilms Tumor Study 5, as well as 78, and that included 78 pretreatment primary favorable histology Wilms tumors that subsequently relapsed, as well as 39 diffuse anaplastic Wilms tumors. And then a validation set of 651 cases, 533 of those were favorable histology Wilms tumors registered on the National Wilms Tumor Study 5 protocol that were enriched for relapses, and then 118 diffuse anaplastic Wilms tumors. And this is the results from the discovery set samples. So of those 78 favorable histology Wilms tumors, 76 completed the full analysis. As you can see, the most common genes impacted were beta-catenin, DGCRH, Drosha, MLLT1, MCN61, 62, TP53, WT1, and WTX. So a lot of these have been known for many years um, to be mutated in Wilms tumor. And then there were some new discoveries with the uh, microRNA processing gene mutations. So you can see along the top of this diagram um, are the actual cases for Wilms tumors. And there is some clustering that is noted with the specific mutations sort of clustering together. So you can see that the microRNA processing gene mutations such as DGCR8 and Drosha, as well as 6162 seem to um, correlate together as well as MLLT1, WT1 and beta catenin mutations that correlate together with some um, histology correlations as well as methylation expression. And looking at the somatic mutations in the Wilms tumor validation set, so this very large group of tumors overall, the most common mutation seen was actually TP53 mutations, but that was predominantly in the diffuse anaplastic Wilms tumor population with about 48% of those um, patients having this mutation, but only about 2% of the favorable histology patients. Of note, the really only difference that we saw um, in the mutational burden and the mutations seen in these tumors between diffuse anaplastic and favorable histology was TP53. Otherwise, the remainder of the mutations were pretty consistent throughout both groups. The second most common was beta-catenin, followed by Drosha, WT1, WTX, and DGCR8. So moving forward, what are some challenges to early phase clinical trials for Wilms tumor? So we know that their outcomes for people or for patients with Wilms tumor are very good. So there are really small numbers of children available for enrollment on early phase clinical trials. We know that there are low numbers of somatic mutations that are considered targetable with the agents that are currently available. We also know that there's genetic heter heterogeneity of Wilms tumor. So a large number of genes, as we just discussed, have driver mutations 
but there's really only a small number of gene expression patterns and attempts to target processes or pathways may actually be more efficient than targeting mutations themselves. There's also a lack of data on the genetics of Wilms tumor at relapse. We have seen some reports that show chromosomal abnormalities as well as co-occurrence of 6-1 and Drosia mutations in relapse patients, but we really need more data to have more information on what might be the most appropriate um, drugs to use in this early phase process. There is ongoing work through the Moonshot Initiative and other projects that can help to close this gap in knowledge in the coming years. So looking at prior Wilms tumor phase one and two clinical trials, this was briefly mentioned um, by the other speakers earlier. This was a review of published data of phase one and two studies from 2005 to 2020, which was published by Brock et al. in the European Journal of Cancer back in 2021 this year, <laughs> there were a total of 257 patients with relapsed Wilms tumor that were enrolled across 79 total trials in the US and Europe. Only 14% experienced tumor control. There were six patients with a complete response, 16 patients with a partial response, and 15 patients who had stable disease. Of note, there were approximately 10 to 15 patients per year that were enrolled that remained consistent from 2005 to 2020. And we noted that Wilms tumor specific early phase trials are very rare. Most of these patients were enrolled on non-specific um, early basket trials. And no agent came out as being very promising um, specifically for the treatment of Wilms tumor relapse patients. So what do we have currently that we can use to try to stratify our patients onto studies? Through the Children's Oncology Group, there is the Pediatric MATCH study, which stands for Molecular Analysis for Therapy Choice. This utilizes genetic sequencing to match patients with relapsed refractory disease with targeted biologic agents. This study accrued very well. It total had 13 treatment protocols, but is closing quite soon. There was recent data presented at the Children's Oncology Group meeting in the fall that said for the first 1,000 patients that were screened, 31% of them overall, and this is not specific to renal tumors, had a study-defined actionable mutation, 28% of patients matched to a treatment protocol, and 13% of those patients ended up enrolling, as many patients would have received other treatments in the interim, or the study just would not have been available for enrollment at the time that the patient matched to that arm of the study. Upcoming in the future is the COG combo match. This will include lots of drug combinations. So we have hope that combining these biologic agents with other biologic agents or with um, standard chemotherapy drugs will be effective for our patient population. This will rely heavily on preclinical in vivo testing with combinations only moving forward that have at least additive effects in two relevant models. And the, the effect has to be at least stable disease to move forward. A little bit of discussion on the European Cancer Predisposition Program. So they are using molecular profiling trial, trials using NGS to determine potentially actionable tar targets in relapsed and refractory tumors. There are many different studies that are open, including the INFORM trial, the mappy axe trial, similar programs in the UK and Denmark. They have enrolled over 2,000 pediatric patients, and about 3% of those patients had recurrent Wilms tumor. There is also the Secured Access European Proof of Concept Therapeutic Stratification Trial of Molecular Anomalies in Relapse or Refractory Tumors. This is a multi-arm platform that explores targeted agents or combinations in a population enriched with patients that have these molecular alterations. There is also a lot of use of PDX models and organoids, which will help to select agents as we move forward to future trials. So moving on to the current um, and recently completed COG phase one and two clinical trials, ADVL1414 was a phase one study. Um, it is currently enrolling in expansion cohort, specifically CNS, using Selenexor, which is an XPO1 inhibitor, which is a member of the microRNA processing gene family of, of um, genes. There are two separate recommended phase two doses on two different schedules that have been um, defined. There was pediatric preclinical testing consortium data that showed responses in two of three Wilms tumor models, one with a maintained complete response and one with a um, delayed time to progression. Eltonexor is a second generation um, agent in the same family that is currently being investigated for development by Mike Ortiz with the Children's Oncology Group. It has less CNX, 
DNS toxicity, and there was hope that this could move forward um, in our patient population. Moving on to ADVL 1615. This is a phase one study that recently closed, which involved pevidinostat, which is a NED8 activating enzyme inhibitor, timazolamide, and arenatecan. It has a recommended phase two dose that was determined without significant toxicity. We do have pediatric preclinical testing consortium data that shows intermediate activity, so a delayed time to progression in two of three Wilms tumor PDX models, including anaplastic patient or anaplastic model. There's also ADVL 1921, which is a phase one and two study. This is using pebliciclib, which is a CDK4 and 6 inhibitor in combination with temozolamide and arenatecan, or in combination with topotecan and cyclophosphamide. This does have a recommended phase 2 dose, and PK expansion is currently accruing. There are dose expansion cohorts that are planned, specifically a randomized um, Ewing sarcoma phase 2 cohort. And there are some really interesting agents coming um, down the pipeline for the children's oncology group, specifically of a lot of interest to not only our group, but also the hepatoblastoma group and many others, is PEP in 2011, which is Tegavivant. This is a beta-catenin inhibitor. This will be a phase one and two study in pediatric solid tumor patients with expansion cohorts specifically, including Ewing sarcoma, desmoid, osteohepatic, Wilms and then any patients with WENT signaling pathway abnormalities. This does have NCI and CIRB approval with hopes to activate very soon, hopefully after the first of the year. Within our committee specifically, we have had a lot of discussion about the need to begin to obtain preclinical combination data to really be ready to move forward if this agent has a signal in the Wilms tumor population to be able to move forward um, with combination agents, including specifically um, the arenatecan model, which has been discussed frequently throughout the course of this educational session. Other things that are upcoming is PEP in 2112. This is a phase one, two study of Bayer 1895344 in solid tumors. This does not have a Wilms tumor specific arm, but there is some pediatric preclinical testing consortium data of a different ATR inhibitor, which is M6620, which was given alone on days one and eight, or in combination with cisplatin on days two and nine, which did show some activity um, in some different Wilms tumor models. So if you look here at the combination in KT13, which is a Wilms tumor model, there was a delayed time to progression. And then there was intermediate response in the KT5 Wilms tumor model with a complete response in that model. So there is definitely some interest preclinically within this agent. Um, and this will be opening soon through the um, COG DVL group. Moving forward to PEP in 1924, which is DS8201 alpha. This is an anti HER2 antibody conjugated to a cytotoxic payload composed of an exotecan derivative that inhibits topoisomerase 1. This is currently a phase two study that is open to osteosarcoma only. However, there is a lot of interest in expanding the study to include Wilms tumor patients. A prior study found about a third of Wilms tumors were strongly positive for HER2 staining. There's also PPTC data that shows elevated ERBB2 mRNA expression in both Wilms tumors and rhabdoid tumors. And DS8201 alpha was administered at five milligrams per kilo on day one. And of those models, you can see Wilms tumor, there were three total models and two of those models showed a complete response or a maintained complete response. So a very high level of response. There also was response seen in the rhabdoid tumor models as well. So there's definitely... Um, a high level of activity seen and interest in expanding this clinical trial to allow Wilms tumor enrollments. Um, we do currently have a BPC protocol approved to test a Wilms tumor tissue microarray with the same HER2 antibody used on this clinical trial to confirm positivity to provide additional data to allow this to move forward. And just a brief word on anaplastic histology Wilms tumor. AZD1775 is a selective inhibitor of WE1. There was PPTC data with the combination of ADZ1775 with arenatecan given on days one to five. This is KT13, which is an anaplastic Wilms tumor model. And you can see there was a partial response in this model with the combination of arenatecan and ADZ1775 with a greater than 50% regression. 
ADVL 1312 was a phase one, two study combining this agent with arenatecan. This did complete accrual, has a recommended phase two dose, and there are ongoing discussions with the company about the direction of the drug we'll take moving forward to determine if this would be something we would be able to have a phase two arm to look at um, anaplastic histology Wilms tumor patients moving forward. So in conclusion, additional data is really needed on the genetics of Wilms tumor at relapse to guide our early phase clinical trials. Wilms tumor specific early phase clinical trials are needed. Increasing will tumor enrollment on early phase clinical trials will be helpful. Currently, there is a need to focus on enrollment of Wilms tumor patients on available basket trials with preclinical evidence of response. And PDX and organoid models could be helpful with development of new clinical trials moving forward in the future. And just some acknowledgments, I didn't list everyone on the COG Real Tumor Committee because I know Dr. Dome did that earlier um, to the acknowledge the Children's Oncology Group Developmental Therapeutics Committee, who we work with closely, the entire PSYOP community, community for ongoing and future collaborations, and of course, the patients and their families without which none of this work would be possible. Thank you for listening today and attending our session. All right. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Amy, that, that was a great overview, and also Filippo and Marcio for your wonderful um, presentations, very educational and um, informative. Um, we have a number of questions in the chat and the timing is quite good. We have about 15 minutes to discuss the questions. So I guess we'll start at the top. I, I answered some of the questions already um, by chat, but. Um, the first question is whether the umbrella trial considers histology at relapse in the choice of treatment, or is only histology at initial treatment taken into account? So that, I think, is a good question for Filippo. Uh, yes, this, this is a good uh, question. So this is a relevant question. Only histology at the uh, initial tumor is taken into consideration for risk stratification, but uh, we need to remind and to remark uh, that whether anaplasia is identified at relapse, uh, this is a reason to consider the patients uh, as a very high risk patient. So only anaplasia at relapse is regarded to uh, upgrade the risk at relapse. Yeah, and I'll add that it's the same on the AREN 1921 study. The, the only patients who are eligible for that study are patients with relapsed favorable histology Wilms tumor. And if anaplasia is confirmed at the time of relapse, then those patients would not be eligible. All right, uh, moving along, we have a question I also think would be best for Filippo. How will you minimize the effects of in vitro phylogenetic drift in organoid cultures affecting treatment choices in the CC group? Uh, well, I, I, I think that uh, uh, this is a relevant issue because, uh, I mean, we need to take into consideration phylogenetic evolution, also bringing to intratumular heterogeneity. We know is an issue in Wilms tumor. Maybe I'm not the right person to answer to these questions. Uh, Jarno Drost, who is the principal investigator, has an outstanding experience on growing organoid. But let me share just a few, few considerations. The first one, I need to remark that uh, the, the organoid study is at uh, a very early stage. It's a pilot study, feasibility study. We are just uh, testing the efficacy of organoid growing. And I can anticipate it in the first few patients that uh, organoid are growing with a, a good uh, efficiencies. But as far as we know, and uh, Jarno has already observed, the um, histology of organoid sample is very nicely recapitulated histology of the primary tumor. And we are also using a molecular uh, characterization of the organoids to compare with the primary tumor, because I think that this issue of uh, uh, possible uh, phylogenetic evolution is something we need to take into consideration. For instance, in, in adult cancer, this is not a major issue. So we know that in, in uh, for instance, in gastrointestinal cancer, uh, organoids, uh, the use of organoids for drug testing has been successful and 
patient-derived organoids uh, uh, roughly recapitulated patients' responses in the clinic, but we need to recognize that this might not be the same for an heterogeneous tumor like VIMS. Thank you. That, that organoid work is very exciting, so it will, we'll know in a few years how fruitful that will be. Great question and response. Um, another question, um, shifting gears a little bit, is um, for resource-limited settings, for relapse wilms tumor with bone marrow metastasis, or I, I would guess with any relapse wilms tumor treated with three drugs before, what would be the best treatment option other than stem cell transplant? So, so this is a question about the treatment of relapse wilms tumor in a resource limited setting. So um, Filippo, do you yeah. want to start that? And then I'll add. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Jeff. I, I can make, share some comments. First, I think that mm -hmm. uh, it is important uh, to, uh, to distinguish which are uh, the possibilities and the uh, opportunities in different settings. I mean, as a general comment, I would say that the use of effective drug like carboplatin, etoposide, cyclophosphamide, and iphosphamide at also an intensive dose is feasible also in the setting of low and middle income countries, in countries with limited resources. So I would say that uh, uh, drug combinations like uh, ice or less intensive cyclo uh, and uh, to poside or to poside in carboplatin, if these drugs will be available, show it to be good options to uh, treat patients uh, also in low resource uh, setting. But I'm, I, I'm interested to know your, your opinion as well, Marcio and Jeff. Yeah, I, I think that's a very interesting question. And uh, these these treatment regimens are definitely more intensive than the treatment regimens for upfront therapy. So I think the um, the answer really depends on the the setting and and the individual institution. But as Filippo pointed out, it, it is possible to deliver these salvage types of agents in in some of the settings. One of the um, combinations that I've been interested in in the limited resource setting is are the arena TCAN containing regimens. And um, I've had discussions with Trin Israels about this, um, thinking about whether we could get access to arena TCAN in low and low middle income countries. Um, and, and an advantage of that is, is that the arena TCAN regimens don't typically uh, reduce the blood counts as much as some of the other regimens. And in general, they're pretty well tolerated in young children. Um, another interesting thing is that arena TCAN, we, we haven't done it this way in COG, but arena TCAN <clears throat> can be given orally if, if you adjust the dose. So um, that is attractive to me um, to be able to give an oral agent that has a high level of activity for Wilms tumor, that, that could be beneficial in some settings. But um, I, I think it's important to think about, um, about treatment in, uh, uh, for relapsed Wilms tumor around the world. Marcia? Jeff, yes, uh, thank you. Um, it, uh, this is obviously a challenge as I try to demonstrate. At this point, we don't know uh, that bone marrow transplant is of any uh, further benefit than the current chemotherapy that we use. The only point I would like to make, if available, if the drugs that uh, Filippo mentioned are available in those uh, countries, uh, I would just like to remind them that the use of uh, ice is probably more toxic than the alternating of, of carboplatin etoposide with cyclophosphamide etoposide. Probably similar outcomes, but uh, definitely less toxic, at least by review of the literature that is available. Thanks. Jeff, uh, Thanks. Jeff, 
if I may add a further comment, I think that the issue of uh, rescue, relapse treatment in low research settings sometimes is very important as a palliative, uh, uh, with a palliative intent. Uh, and sometimes for this purpose also, combine, I, have, I have seen use combination with a, a sort of metrono metronomic regimen with orally administered etoposide or sacrophosphate. So sometimes uh, keep in mind that let's keep in mind that also with palliative intent, uh, we can administer low dose of, uh, uh, of uh, orally available drugs uh, to improve the patient uh, uh, quality of life. Thank you. Thanks, Filippo. We also have a question from Norbert Graf, um, and he asks, now that we have molecular data from many patients, is it possible to analyze the outcome of high dose therapy and stem cell rescue according to molecular findings? Is it possible to find a group of patients that may have a better outcome after high dose chemotherapy? So um, Marcio, do you wanna start with that one? Yeah, I think that is uh, absolutely a great question. And I think uh, as we look at molecular data, I think we should look at uh, drug resistant uh, molecular data. Uh, because, um, you know, it's just not a question of uh, being um, sensitive to therapy, but is the use of higher dose or different agents overcoming uh, drug resistance? So I think it's a, a very pertinent question, and I think we should really collect uh, the patients that we have and try to analyze. Again, it would be a retrospective uh, analysis with very uh, different uh, regimens used, but I think we may be able to start teasing some information that may be used in the future, not only to decide who should get high dose therapy, but also uh, to suggest uh, other new agents that can be used either post therapy or as part of the treatment of those patients. Right, thank you. Um, we have a few more questions and a couple of minutes. So um, I'll just take the first ones in the chat and I apologize to the people whose questions we can't get to, but certainly you could feel to, free to reach out to any of the speakers and we can answer your questions offline. So one question for, these are two for Amy. Uh, one question is where, was molecular profiling done on the tumors or in the blood? And um, also have any next generation sequencing uh, studies been done on samples of tumors in children who have received preoperative chemotherapy? Yes, so for the target initiative, those studies were done on tumors themselves. The um, work that's currently under being done with the Moonshot Initiative actually compares some trios and also does um, look at those patients at the time of relapse. So hopefully we'll get some new data coming out of the Moonshot Initiative for those relapse patients. And then a lot of the sequencing that we have performed um, in the States with the Children's Oncology Group has also had counterparts in Europe as well. So a lot of those patients were pre-therapy treated with chemotherapy and a lot of the um, same genetic mutations and drivers are coming out in those studies as well. So we really think that you know, the, the population of um, genes that we're seeing is, is seems to be what's driving Wilms tumor, regardless of the time that you're getting that biopsy. If it's done pre-chemotherapy um, or post, those same mutations are holding true. Okay, thanks. And, and I will add that there is a lot of work being done on circulating tumor DNA, and, and that's, that's a very exciting area that, that is um, actively under investigation now. Absolutely. And then we have um, a question from Mary Vanden Heuvel Eibrink. Um, Amy, wonderful presentation. Do you anticipate there will be a role for immunotherapy or CAR Ts in children with high risk relapsed or refractory tumors in the near future? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. I think the immune therapy question is prevalent across um, the entire cancer population. I think particularly those patients with anaplasia where TP53 is involved, I think that um, immune therapy could be important there. And then I will let Jeff say a little note about the current ongoing study um, that he is working on that is treating patients with CAR-T um, with relapsed high-risk whelms. 
Yeah, so so thanks, Amy. We, we actually have a, a study of uh, tumor antigen associated T cells that target three antigens. One of them is WT1. So it's very interesting for Wilms tumor. And we've enrolled a number of Wilms tumor patients and, and several have had very prolonged um, disease-free intervals. So that was just in the phase one study setting and, and certainly more work needs to be done. But I do think that there are some promising results out there and, and um, it's definitely an interesting field for further study. And I think we are out of time. So I would like to thank everyone again. I apologize that we haven't gotten to everyone's questions, but um, again, feel free to reach out to us. And I'd like to thank the speakers and also the participants for your great uh, participation and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.